my pleasure to introduce Addy Dove uh, to discuss initial results from the Strata One Regolith Microgravity Survey. Thanks. All right, and now for something sort of different. Uh, so I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about micrometeoroids or uh, impacts today. Um, but I am going to talk about an experiment that we've had running on the International Space Station for about a year. Um, and keep in mind, as uh, I'm talking about this, that this is a, I'm going to talk about this at the end, but this is a facility that we sort of had a test out this last year on. And we're planning on using this as a facility that can be a user facility in the future. So keep that in mind as I'm describing the experiments we're doing. Think about what you might want to do if you had this opportunity as well, because you could have this opportunity. All right. So uh, we have a, I have a long list of co-authors on this uh, work. It was actually led out of the ARIES group at Johnson Space Center. Um, Mark Fries and Kristen John were the leads on the project, uh, and Lee Graham, Paul Abel, and a number of other people. Um, and then at UCF, we were involved in building the hardware, and we're doing a lot of the scientific analysis uh, that's come along since we've gotten our data back. All right, so brief uh, reintroduction to regolith on planetary surfaces. Uh, there's just some great pictures here, right, that we've gotten from spacecraft that have visited other planetary bodies, Itakawa, Eros. Uh, this is Itakawa right here. This is Eros. And when we've seen these bodies up close and personally, we've noticed that the distribution of particles on their surfaces uh, varies widely. Some areas, it's nice and smooth. So we see here on Itakawa, and some places have really bouldery, blocky surfaces. Uh, we've also learned uh, that there are the small bodies themselves, so things like Itakawa, things like arrows, might be rubble piles. So that means they're not actually one cohesive body at the center. They're probably piles of rubble that are sort of gravitationally bound together. And you may see that structure expressed in the surface layers as well. Uh, and there are many proposed processes for modifying the surfaces of these small bodies. Um, some of them here are impacts. We've heard a lot about that so far. Uh, landslides, uh, electrostatic motion. So Mihai showed those beautiful videos of dust particles moving. Um, and also thermal cracking is a, sort of a more recent uh, explanation for how you can get different size distributions and also motion on the surface. Uh, so I'm not actually going to talk about any of those today, uh, but I am going to talk a little bit about how seismicity or uh, motion due to impacts might affect uh, regolith motion in a microgravity experiment. All right, so uh, one more thing before I go on to our pictures of our experiment. We, this is a, a, a figure I took from a review paper that is in Asteroids 4, uh, which just shows sort of what the size distribution of particles on different planetary bodies might be. So here, it's a little hard to read in the figure, but up here is Itakawa. Um, we also have Eros um, and some other planetary bodies. And you can see here that generally, uh, the size distribution of particles on their surfaces follows a slope that's about uh, a three, slope of three. So um, you, th in that case, you get many particles ranging from very fine particles, so less than centimeter sizes, these micron sizes that we've been talking about, all the way up to larger boulders that can be greater than 10 meters that are actually seen on the surfaces of these bodies. So you have a large particle size distribution um, that we have to sort of understand how that both gets developed and how it can move around on a planetary surface. Uh, and there's different things you can learn about the size of the, or the, the, de the the slope, if it's shallow, it may indicate that there's less, been less processing. Um, if it's steeper, you've had different processes at work. So we can try to understand that a little bit better by looking at these planetary surfaces, infer a little bit about what's happened on the surface and underneath inside the body. So once again, we have some nice pretty pictures here of these planetary surfaces. And the thing I want to emphasize is that all of these observations are generally uh, visible observations. So we get a lot of camera images of the surface. Sometimes you get some thermal or infrared uh, information about a surface that can tell you more about particle size. But a lot of it comes from visual observations of surfaces. And from that, we have to infer what's going on. So we need ways to uh, tie those observations to actual experiments and actually be able to see uh, how you can make different size distributions on surfaces, how you can move particles around uh, on a, in a microgravity environment on bodies just like this. Uh, and 
one way to actually sort of start to figure this out is going to the bodies, right? So you could have something like the OSIRIS-REx mission, uh, which is going to actually sample some bits of the surface, see what the particle sizes are, see what the particle size distribution is. Um, perhaps someday we'll have a, a mission that goes and picks up a boulder from a surface of a planetary body. Um, and again, we've been to the moon, we've gotten samples from there, we have that actual sample, um, but we could go back and look at more about the particle size distribution on the surface. So that brings me to the description of strata. So strata was an experiment uh, that we built and flew on the International Space Station. Uh, and this is sort of just a general uh, design of it. I'll show you some more pictures here in a minute. But basically, it consisted of four different tubes filled with regolith uh, and some electronics, lighting, and cameras. So this was an experiment that we uh, put up there for about a year on the space station. I'll go to the next slide. You can see the actual pictures of our simulants. Uh, it was a passive experiment. So this was, again, a test bed. So it was a passive experiment. We just put the regolith in these tubes and put it up on the space station. But it turns out the space station itself isn't actually that passive. There's a lot of interesting vibrational environments uh, that happen up there. So even though you're in microgravity, you actually get vibration at different frequencies that can disturb the regolith. And we thought we'd maybe see things move around a little bit. Turns out it's far more active up there than we expected. Um, so I'm going to show you some videos here of that in a minute. So we had four different simulants. Uh, some of them were just spherical glass beads. We do those because it's really good to compare with numerical simulations. We also had glass shards, so they were a similar size distribution as the glass beads. Um, and then we had a meteorite simulant and an actual meteorite that we crushed with a sledgehammer. So if you saw uh, Dan Britt's talk yesterday, he was showing us crushing it with a sledgehammer. We then sent it back to space. We were like, no, Rock, you go back to space. So um, we sent it back up to the space station, and it's since come back, I guess. But, um, and we had these nice different particle size distributions that we initially started out with in the tubes. <clears throat> we also had these uh, devices that we call the entrapulator, uh, which was just a compression device to keep the, two, the material compressed for launch and landing. And then it was uh, retracted once it was on orbit to give the particles a little bit of room, only about an extra centimeter of space to move around. Uh, so here you can actually see images of these experiments on orbit. Uh, again, we have our spherical simulants, our crushed meteorite, our carbonaceous uh, chondrite, and our crushed glass. There are obviously some experimental uh, parameters we are going to work on for the next time, such as some of the glare we got and some of the imaging. Um, but overall, we got really interesting data that showed us all of these particles moving around over the course of time on the space station. Uh, we also additionally had this instrument on the front of our experiment. It's called SAMS. It's an accelerometer that they use all throughout the space station. We had one unit mounted directly on the Strata experiment. All right, so let's get to some more results. Okay, so hopefully you can see, if you watch closely enough, uh, these are two different videos, <clears throat> two different uh, periods of time. The image, it's a video constructed from some still images. The, each image itself was taken about an hour apart. So we have some pretty uh, slow motion happening here. I think there's about 10 to 15 images per, uh, per side. This one on the left, uh, I sort of labeled it no event down here at the bottom. You can see that there's motion of the particles in the tube, and I'll go through the details of that here in a second. Um, but there's nothing really sort of big that jostles it. Whereas here on the right, at some point during this time frame, there was a big, what we call a big event that really shook up uh, the regolith in the tube and you see a big fracturing um, in some of the finer regolith that happens when that event occurs. So yeah, it just happened right there. You see this big jump. So right now, a lot of what we're doing is uh, scouring through these images um, and looking for things like these events to see if we can correlate those with accelerometer data, for instance. So I'll show you some accelerometer data in a minute. But we, what we can also get from this is a little bit of trying to understand, all right, what's the particle size distribution here in different parts of the tube, right? We can definitely see down here that there's a lot of the fines that are still very compacted. So they're still uh, sticking together. You do have some fractures. You have some features down in them, but they're very compacted together. Whereas up here in this portion of the tube, there's a lot more motion. Part of this is actually the bigger particles, but some of it is clumps of the fines, either on the particles or clumps just of the fines themselves that have been made up over time. Because you can see here, like when this breaks off, a big chunk of it is actually just the fines that breaks off and moves around. So this is help 
helping give us a little bit of insight about how this might be happening on a planetary body that has very low gravity environment. All right, let's look at another one. This one, more colorful, uh, a little easier to see. The undergrads enjoy when they can look at this one instead of the gray tube. Um, but so this one, you can see that there are, again, this is two different uh, sections in time. I just put them next to each other. But you can see how the different sizes of particles move around throughout the tube. We also see that there seems to be a little bit of a sorting where the bigger beads are on this portion of the tube. This might have to do with the gravity vector uh, on the space station. We're still trying to figure that out. That comes from another data set that we're trying to piece together with our location on the station and what the actual gravity vector was that was moving all these particles around. So some initial data products we're getting from this. Like I said, we're trying to figure out sort of how things are moving and how the particle size distributions are changing with time. One way to do that is to do autocorrelations, look at slices of the tube, either vertically, horizontally, cut it up in different uh, sections, and see sort of what the general particle size distribution is over time and how that changes over time, and then compare it in other portions of the tube. That'll tell us if the particle size distribution is changing at different uh, locations in the tube, if it's sort of uniform throughout, uh, or if we have, like we see here, a lot of these bigger particles sort of in one section that's telling us probably, we think, a little bit about the gravity vector. Uh, it's a lot more difficult in the regolith tubes. The imaging is difficult in those, uh, but we do see, like I said, this clumping effects and the fines that really stay together. Um, just really briefly, this is some of the, the SAMS data, the accelerometer data. So we get accelerometer data that has um, uh, strength at different frequencies. So this is frequency here, and this, the color bars tell you the strength as a function of time. So this is over the course of uh, about six hours. So here we have, um, or eight hours. So here you have a pretty quiescent day. A lot of the red noise is just sort of noise due to other things that are happening on station. There's always this noise down here due to the K band antenna. Uh, but then some days we have these events where you see a large freak, a spike across all frequencies. We're trying to see if those correlate with some of the big jumps we see in the uh, actual motion in the, of the particles in the tubes. And then sometimes other experiments turned on and had their own fun current and uh, acceleration events. So that's what's happening here is this was another experiment in the same rack as ours on the, on the ISS that turned on and was like, I think it was maybe the 3D printer, so it was like shaking around or something. And so we saw that in our accelerometer data. Uh, this is also some work that's being done uh, by our collaborators at Colorado and at the University of Maryland. Um, and so we're trying to do some numerical modeling, as I mentioned earlier, of these, of these uh, tubes to see if we can actually model what we see uh, in the actual data. And so they've come up with a pretty good model that uses a spring dash pot contact system and can model different forces to see how the particles move around. Uh, and finally, these are just uh, images from when it came back to the ground. We have, this was our before, before we sent it up to the ISS, and this was our after. So you can actually see some interesting like porosity and mixtures of the particles in this picture. Keep in mind this is in 1G because this is once it got to the ground. But there's actually some really interesting structure in there. Um, we're going to take some core sections of it afterwards and see what we can see. Uh, so really, really briefly, I know I'm using up my question time, uh, but so the the, the follow-up to this is that we're actually establishing a facility that will be on the International Space Station called Hermes. It'll be basically like the setup we had for Strata, where it's a, an express rack on the ISS, and you can put your own tube in there, or maybe a CubeSat-shaped object. But if you have an experiment you're thinking of that you would love to do in microgravity that has to do preferably with regolith, but actually it can be about almost anything you want, that you'd want camera data, maybe some accelerometer data. It can be a more active experiment. Um, but it has to sort of fit in this form factor. We will work with you to develop that experiment and hopefully put it up on station. And the costs are reduced because the infrastructure is already there. So it's really just developing your experiment and being able to put it up there for six months to a year. Um, so feel free to talk to me about that. And I can give you Kristen John's contact information. She's the PI on Hermes. And I'll stop now. Thanks. Thanks.
uh, Chip Leggett, Stony Brook. I was just curious if you're collecting data during one of the uh, ISS orbital reboosts. Yes. So we, the whole time we were up there, we were collecting data. Um, we can see when Soyuz docking happens, when there's reboosts, things like that. Um, I haven't looked specifically at that, at any of that data yet, though. Turns out a year of data is a lot. And we don't have a lot of funding, so. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. All right.